everybody. Good to see you again. Oh my goodness, everything is falling all at one time. <laughs> what a welcome. Glad to see you here again. And this is the second video of our three-part series. So the first one, in case you missed it, I did in, uh, an extensive overview of the energies of the medicine wheel and what each direction kind of brings into play for us, how it equates to us in our lives, seasons, the gatekeepers, the elements, the chakras, all of it. So if you haven't watched that, please go back and take a look at that video. It's chock full of information. Um, and I think that you'll find that there's probably some familiarity with the different directions once you kind of get to know them. Today we're going to talk a little bit about soul archetypes and what that means for us uh, personally and how they fall into the medicine wheel as well. Uh, before we start and go too much further in, uh, in case you don't know who I am, I'm Dakota and I founded Gaia Wisdom School about, uh, really the name Gaia Wisdom has just changed a couple of times in my life, but I've been doing this work for about 30 years now and really um, diving into what it means to bring spiritual practices into our everyday life and to be able to integrate it so that we're living a um, soul-filled life and that we are empowering ourselves. That's my big uh, thing is, is helping you find your way back to uh, being empowered and being authentically you and, and really allowing you to, to live a life that is, is so rich that um, there's not a day that goes by that there's not something uh, moving in your life. Uh, I started when I was in my early 20s, um, I'll just share this story. I went through a really hard breakup uh, with a relationship and it was really the first time that I had uh, my heart broken into a thousand million pieces. And I was, uh, I was young, I was like 21 years old and I really, um, at that point in my life, I I'm glad I had the foresight to uh, follow my, my intuition and I had a vision, I had a, 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 a like an astral projection type vision. I was sitting in the uh, Georgia airport and I was waiting to, to fly back home and this song came on in uh, my earbuds and all of a sudden, boom, I was transported out of the Georgia airport and I was in a completely different environment and I could see my life from a very different perspective and I had uh, a choice to either go back to everything I knew or to go into the world of the unknown and in shamanic terms now that I understand all of this I was shown a threshold and I could cross over that threshold and embrace this new life and in doing so it would be more align with who I was as a person. And so I took this huge leap of faith and I followed myself out into Arizona. And in that time, uh, in those first, uh, probably that first year that I lived in Arizona, I was really figuring out who I was at that deepest, deepest level. And I remember sitting on top of Camelback Mountain. I'd hiked up there and I was sitting there watching, looking at this whole big valley city and I was contemplating and reflecting back on my life and I really wanted to know what would make me the happiest. It was a question that my grandma always used to ask me. She, I'd, I'd go down and visit her and I'd tell her everything I was doing and. Uh, at the end of all of it, she would say, you know, are you, are you happy? And that question always lingered in my head. What would really make me happy? And so I wrote out all of these things that I wanted. I wanted to, I wanted to hike. I wanted to feel alive. I wanted to explore. And uh, I wanted to make a difference in the world with the work that I did. And, and so I had this whole big list. And now, with the scope of, that I work with, what I was doing is I was chunking out my life into four different compartments. I wanted to have a deep spiritual life. I wanted to have a job where I felt like I contributed to the world around me, that I made a difference in the work that I do. I wanted to have deep, meaningful, connected relationships. I wanted to feel love. I wanted to feel passion. I wanted to have 
like vitality in and sensuality and I wanted all these things that made me come alive and then I wanted to really be able to um, explore and and see the world that I was living in. I was living in an entirely different environment and I really was excited about kayaking and hiking and canyoneering and all of these things and I wanted to eat healthy and be physically fit and I wanted to really be in love with where I lived and so as I map this out and to what now I know is, is the medicine wheel, it all began to make sense to me that I can't have one and feel completely and fully happy. I needed to have the other and the other and the other. And I needed to bring them all together and be living this completely. And so that became really the basis for the work that I do. I went on from there to uh, practice massage therapy for, uh, I was a massage therapist for 20 some years. Um, I've done holistic medicine and this was another uh, pivotal moment for me in shifting my my sacred purpose was that uh, here I was uh, fully trained by um, Dr. Theodore Broody. Uh, some of you may know him from his book Alkalize or Die. He's one of the uh, leading um, contemporaries on uh, alkalinity and how it affects our body. And so I worked with Dr. Baruti, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one for a long time and spent hours upon hours upon hours upon hours with him in his studio and him just filling my brain with all of these ideas and concepts. And his work actually really kind of encapsulates the medicine wheel also in, in a different way. But I set up practice in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and I had a thriving practice. And I was seeing people who uh, were really at their last, uh, I was their last ditch effort. You know, these, I was seeing people who were in stage four of cancer uh, and had all of these things that were happening in their lives from a physical ailment. And, you know, we'd go through all these testings and I'd find all these things and we'd get them on a regimen and it would include health and supplements and exercise and all these things that were attacking, not attacking, but going at it from the physical standpoint. And I got to a place in my work where I was very, very successful. I had, um, you know, a, a, a cancer turnaround rate of almost 95%. But at that point, I realized that I was getting people in my office who really didn't need to be there because most often all of those uh, ailments, all those Ill illnesses and sicknesses and, and imbalances were caused by either a spiritual imbalance, a, an imbalance in the east direction energy or an imbalance in the emotional body which is in the south direction. And I took a step back and I thought, you know, I want to I want to bring forward all the things that I learned in my childhood and in my young adult and in my personal life. And I, at that point, I had already been doing shamanic work for, gosh, probably 15, 20 years also. And I, I wanted to reach people before they got to the place of cancer or the place of arthritis or the place of asthma. I wanted to I wanted to, to meet them before that so that they never had to get to that place. And to do that I needed to step fully into my shamanic path, which is what I did. I, I made the bold decision. Uh, it was one afternoon actually. I had a friend come in for an appointment and that was the moment that I had that, that whole sequence of thoughts come through to me. And I asked her, I said, would you be open to me doing something a little bit different today and see where it goes? And she said, sure, why not? And so I took her on a soul walk and I took her into the interior of her soul through a meditation and got her to meet her spirit guides and to visit a past life and to see where all of this physical stuff stemmed from. What was the original wound? And then we went in, we did some soul retrieval, we did a little bit of contract work, cut some cords, and she was never the same after that. 
she began to get healthier, she started seeing things a little bit differently, and I saw almost instantaneously the effects of the work that we did together. And that was, for me, my go-ahead to go back to what I really believe firmly in, what I have always done for myself, to bring that into my practice and begin doing that. So I gave up my holistic uh, practice and holistic medicine practice and I started doing fully uh, meditation and, um, and shamanic work. And as a result, I'm here today teaching a mentorship to people from all over the globe. We have about 20, uh, uh, 20 countries represented in the medicine wheel, in the uh, mentorship that I teach. I've got probably close to 2 million uh, views now on my meditations between Insight Timer, Mind Bliss, and YouTube, and I don't know where else I am, but anyway, those, those three avenues alone, I've, I've, um, I'm ranking up in the, in the high percentile on Insight Timer, which makes me really happy. And so I've, I've been able to get my work out there into the world, and I've, I've been shown that uh, I am on my sacred purpose because it is well received with where I uh, have put it. And so I bring to all of this and to you today all of my experience, all of my knowledge that I've gained from working with different shamans and different doctors and um, direct revelation and, and really my insatiable thirst for uh, one, living my sacred purpose, but two, to bring people back into the fullness of their soul. There's so many of us who have walked around on this earth in, uh, in half mode. You know, we're not fully present or we're not fully living the life that we want to live. There's just one piece or two pieces that are, that are out, off kilter. And so my goal, my, my overriding, overachieving goal is to, in this, this short life that I have, to give as much as I can to bring people back into that fold of, of their humanity, of their spirituality, and to find balance in their lives and to realize, one, how connected we are, but also how powerful you are. And to use that power for um, beautiful things. I'm not talking about a power from ego. I'm talking about a power from um, that, that soul level, which is exactly what all of us need to embody if we want to change this world. So the fact that you're watching this video means that you are changing the world because anytime that we work on ourselves, we are shifting humanity to a better place. Uh, I, I can't go out there. I can't change you. I can't change anybody. I can only change me. I can offer what I know, the wisdom that I know, but ultimately you have to take that wisdom and decide what you're going to do with it. I can't do that for you. Nobody can do that for you. So in the long and short, I'm Dakota and that's what I'm here to do. That's why I'm here. Uh, I, I believe 1000% in what I do. And I believe that I am, um, I, I speak my truth, I walk my truth, and I think anybody who knows me or has followed me for so, quite some time uh, sees that. You know, I, I, I show up. I show up however I am in that day and in that moment. Um, but I am unapologetically me. So, uh, love that or hate it, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I am. So today we're going to talk about soul archetypes and uh, how that plays into the medicine wheel. And I will tell you that the soul archetypes are, um, they're kind of my thing. I, I did a, a meditation, I did a journey back in uh, uh, 2006. Um, yeah, I was living in Charleston, 2006. And I, at that point, had been teaching the medicine wheel. And I just, I, I knew there was just one more layer of this medicine wheel that I wasn't quite getting. And what I was seeing that led me to that thought was that I was seeing people who were embodying certain energy types of the medicine wheel and um, 
that they were living, kind of living their life through the lens of that one direction. And then I found some people who were just like, you know, whoa, they're all over the place. And there was no kind of rhyme or reason to them. They were just everywhere. So I did this journey and I went to the upper world and I wanted to work with my Akashic Records and my spirit guides. And then I kind of called in some other shamans and, um, you know, elders to, to help me figure this out. You know, just show me. I, I know I've got some kind of nugget here. I just need to flesh it out and 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 really um, give some life to it. And what I was shown were five different soul archetypes, and they each had a very specific name. And they they showed me where on the wheel that this old soul archetype uh, lived. And then I started to see all of these threads coming together like okay if you were if you were a visionary living in the east direction but you were deficient you had not enough energy or you had too much energy then it would cause all this stuff to shift down here and uh, in the south direction or in the west direction or north direction and so what i was seeing was that even though we have one archetype that is kind of how we lead with our life we actually embody all five soul archetypes at once and we can be deficient, balanced, or in excess in any of the directions, all the directions. And most often we're going to have a little bit of all three of those percentages. We're going to be balanced. We're going to be excess. We're going to have deficient energy in the east and in the south and in the west and in the north and in, in the center. And so when I came out of that, uh, here's, here's what happened. <laughs> it was actually kind of funny in retrospect, when I was in the journey, I could see it all, and it all made so much sense to me intuitively. It was like an instantaneous knowing of what all of that meant and how it was mapped out. It was beautiful. It was the most beautiful thing I think I'd ever seen in a journey because it was so intricate and so precise uh, and, and the correlations, it was like this, this piece of wisdom that just got turned on inside of me that was like the huge aha moment. And it brought home for me every lingering piece that there was about the medicine wheel and put it into this nice package. Then, when I came out of the journey, my... Um, conscious mind came back. I'm like, whoa, what the heck just hit me? <laughs> I and mean, I'm trying to, to scramble to get it all on paper and like the sequence of it and what they showed me and the names and the attributes and what does this mean and what does that mean? And I'll never forget, it was, uh, I had two uh, eight foot long tables uh, that I, folding tables that I pulled out of my closets and I, lay, I set them up in my living room, took over the entire living room, and I stayed up all night, all night long, and I just wrote and typed and wrote and typed and drew, and I had papers everywhere, and by the morning I had just these 16 feet of just all of these papers with everything mapped out that I could, the best that I could. And that night, is the foundation of everything that I'm going to teach you today and also what I teach in the mentorship. And because there is all of this uh, surrounding it, I can never possibly put it all into one video, not one that you would sit through anyway. So we're going to touch on them today and I'll give you enough of an understanding so that you can kind of see it, uh, see all the archetypes. And then in the next video, I'm going to bring in kind of like a real world scenario um, and show you how you would take it to the wheel and how you would manipulate the energies of the soul archetypes and, and find your way through that situation using the medicine wheel. And that's going to be my, my kind of nugget for you that, that I think is going to make a lot more sense than all of this esoteric stuff that I'm sharing with you. But anyway... Uh, in the mentorship, you will learn all of the soul archetypes and really what their attributes are and how to 
really, really bring that knowledge into um, an integrated place within yourself. The other thing we do in the mentorship is you go through, um, we call it an energy assessment test that actually shows you exactly what percentages you have in every single direction of deficient, balanced, and excess, and why. And then we start to use that information as we go around the wheel to affect all of the different directions simultaneously. So that's a lot of information. I'm sorry, I just threw that all out at you. This is all unscripted, so I'm just like, Bleh. I, I tend to go off on a lot of tangents. So anyway, let's, uh, let's draw out the medicine wheel. Now, in the first, uh, in the first video, you learned that we have um, uh, seven directions in the medicine wheel, and we have five soul archetypes. Father Sky and Mother Earth do not have a soul archetype; they are the archetype. So that's that. The North, we have what we call the Soul Shaman. I'm just going to write these out first and then we'll go through each one. In the east we have the visionary. In the south we have the sacred heart warrior. And then in the west we have um, the uh, alchemist. And then in the center of the wheel, right there, we've got the Wisdom Keeper. Now, something about the Wisdom Keeper. Um, the Wisdom Keeper is where we aspire to be. Because what happens with the Wisdom Keeper is that when they are in balance, and that's, that's, the, that's the catch, when they are in balance, they sit in the middle of the wheel and they can pull energy from any direction that they need at any given time. They can see the whole picture. And so when, like the work that we do in the mentorship is specifically to balance out all of these so that we can be in that center spot. For me personally, I'm a soul shaman. That is what I lead my life with. So when you take the, um, the test, the soul archetype test, and if you took it before you watched this video, what you saw was uh, you probably came back with percentages. And it probably said you were, um, like I'm 23% soul shaman, 23% wisdom keeper, 19% visionary, 19% sacred heart warrior, and 14% alchemist. Those are my actual um, as of today. This fluctuates. As you grow, as you learn, this fluctuates. Um, now interestingly enough, I just went through uh, a year of traveling and exploring the United States where I had no stable home base. And I just recently um, moved to a place where now I'm stable and I, I literally just last month, not even last month, um, I got my my belongings and unpacked my boxes. I still have a few boxes here. So my physical world, which is what is in the west direction, has been a little bit in an upheaval. And that's why my percentage has gone down. That used to be uh, much higher. So ideally what happens is you want to have as these percentages as close as possible because that means that you are um, at least equally distributing energy throughout the wheel. Now, what this could mean though, bear with me for one second here, is this 23% is either going to be balanced, excess, or deficient. So you've got to uh, determine, you know, it might be 23%, you might have 12% balanced, and 11% in excess and 1% in deficiency. So it really is important to understand 
where um, how that percentage kind of falls out. That's the extensive test we give in the uh, mentorship. We don't offer that test to the general public because it's um, it's it's pretty involved, and I really want people to have an understanding. Although I may might offer it with this video because you'll have a different understanding of it. I might do that. Let me let me think about that first. <laughs> um, so anyway, you have all these different percentages because we embody all five soul archetypes all the time. We're going to have one archetype, this one's mine, that we kind of are born to lead with and and we need that. We need to have uh, one that we can lock into and say, you know, this is what's most important to me and this is how I am going to present myself in the world. So for me, as a soul shaman, because I'm, I've done a lot of work to balance that out, I lead with my spiritual life. My job is centered around my spiritual life. My relationships have a spiritual foundation. When you look at my home and where I live, uh, there's, there's no question about my spiritual uh, ideologies. I've got books on shamanism. I've got nature. I've got all kinds of things like that. So all, all of my quadrants fit into my, my soul shaman. I'm going to briefly go through each of these so you can kind of have, have an understanding. As you know, just from what I said, Soul Shaman leads with their spiritual life, and they, they tend to be the ones that will uh, gravitate towards healing practices, healing arts, um, working in the esoteric field, uh, pastor, minister, things like that. When you come down to visionary, uh, visionaries are like Steve Jobs or Barack Obama. They're the they have they have dreams and goals. They're the ones who kind of birth uh, technology or communication. Uh, they're great communicators. They are uh, entrepreneurs. They're the ones who are they live in their mental body, but they kind of they kind of take leap into their dreams. They, they're action orientated. They, um, they're the ones that drive us to be better people in the world around us. The Sacred Heart Warrior, they're emotionally driven. They lead with their emotions. They are very intuitive. Uh, also will kind of fall into this line, this feminine line, so they will often go into the healing arts. They're creative, they're artists, they're visionaries in the, um, in the realm of creativity and art. They're musicians, they're dancers, um, they are, uh, they also, relationships to them are extremely important. So they, uh, and this kind of gets a little icky, uh, most people, at least most people who are watching this video, I'm going to say that, because most people watching this video are going to fall in this vein between Sacred Heart Warrior and Soul Shaman and Wisdom Keeper, and because they are by default naturally inclined to do soul work and emotional work. Sacred Heart Warrior is a really easy one to get tripped up in uh, balanced or deficient and excess energy. And when this is out of balance, uh, you're going to feel it all the way around the wheel. You will in the other dire directions too, but uh, this one is because it hits us emotionally is the one that um, uh, it feels very uh, tangible. So codependency, um, emotional drama, things like that. And then we've got the alchemist who is, uh, they, they lead with their physical bodies, their physical surroundings. So to them what's most important, they're, they're really good, and they're in balance, they're really beautiful earth stewards. They take care of the earth, they take care of their bodies, they take care of uh, the space around them. You're going to find people who are um, like personal trainers, health coaches, um, environmentalists, scientists. Uh, they're they're going to be over here in the alchemist um, in the alchemist side. Jobs for Sacred Heart Warrior. I told you, uh, yeah, artists, creatives, etc. Soul shamans in that field. And then we've got the Wisdom Keeper, and the Wisdom Keeper. Uh, now, the Wisdom Keeper is tricky 
because really they can do anything because they have that ability to pull from all of these different directions. Most of the time, most of the time, if you are a wisdom keeper, if that's your highest percentage and you lead as a wisdom keeper, uh, often this will be out of balance um, severely. And the reason for that is because this is kind of like the the last place. You know, in Buddhism you've got Nirvana, in Christianity you've got Heaven. Um, I don't know what some of the other ones are in, based on religion, but when you reach the point of being 100% balanced in the Wisdom Keeper, you're dead. Because we come into this human body, this human bag, this life, so that we can hit that edge constantly and be constantly redefining ourselves and refinishing ourselves and uh, we keep growing and growing and then we get to this level and we grow more and we get to that level and we grow more and we get to that level and we grow more and we are constantly in flux that's why you know two years ago my alchemist was probably one of my most balanced because I was living in the mountains, I spent a lot of time out in nature, uh, all these things. And then last year I disrupted that um, on purpose and it threw that percentage off. And now it's, it's rising back up because I'm redefining where I am. So you're always going to be moving these percentages all over the wheel. Because the Wisdom Keeper Balanced is the one that is so uh, close to that final edge, it's really hard to stay in that balanced place and maintain it. So you'll dip down into the excess or you'll dip down into the deficiency and you'll have some in the balanced, but your deficient and your excess are always going to be moving up and down. And they're the ones that are, that are moving that wheel for you. I hope that makes sense. It's like a, we aspire to be here, we aspire to go to Nirvana, we aspire to go to heaven, we whatever we, we aspire to, but the end goal for us is to constantly be trying to get to that balanced Wisdom Keeper spot. And some days you may have that glimpse of what it feels like to be 100% tapped into the Wisdom Keeper, only to, to the next day, next event happen, and you're like, whoa, pulled back into this fluctuation again. So this is a constant, this is a constant moving of energy. And the the real beauty of um, the whole, all the work is that when you start balancing out these percentages and they're pretty close to each other, like ideally these would all be at about 22%. That would be kind of ideal, 22-23%. And of those percentages, you want to have a higher percentage of balanced and a lower percentage of the excess and deficient. You're never going to have 0% of one or the other, of deficient or excess. You're always going to have some kind of imbalance there because, again, you're always constantly moving against that edge. But when you have these pretty much balanced out to an even number, and that even number is primarily balanced, you begin seeing life in a very, very different, different way. You can step into the role of visionary as needed. You can step into the role of sacred heart warrior as needed, alchemist as needed, soul shaman as needed. And, and I'll tell you this because if you are... Uh, Let's just say that you've, you've got an opportunity to, um, uh, I don't know, take on a new job, okay? It's over here in Visionary. So when you're at that interview, you're interviewing for a new job, you're probably not going to want to bring your deficient Sacred Heart Warrior or your excess Sacred Heart Warrior to that job interview. You're not going to want to be overly emotional or wear your heart on your sleeve or um, exhibit codependency or whatever that might look like in the Sacred Heart Warrior. 
you want to be able to step fully into the visionary. And so if you've got these balanced out, then you step into here and you're confident. You have, you share your ideas, you communicate clearly and articulate your, your thoughts coherently. You've got a greater perspective. You know what your goals are. You know what your ideas are. Um, you know what your strengths are. And you bring all of that to the interview. Now that doesn't mean that you don't bring these also, but you're primarily stepping into the visionary um, spot. You're going to bring in an alchemist because you're probably going to dress the part and you're probably going to brush your hair and brush your teeth and be physically presentable. You're probably going to make sure that your uh, car starts and that you're able to get to the interview in time. You're probably going to pull in hopefully your soul shaman and realize that if this job doesn't align with your spiritual truths it might not be a good fit for you. And you're going to listen to that little inkling of a voice inside of you that's your spirit guides and your higher self that are talking to you. And then you are going to call, you are going to bring in your Sacred Heart Warrior because you are in relationship with whoever's interviewing you. You're going to want to bring in that intuition and follow your gut and you want to be creative and show that you can think outside the box. And so that would be how you would bring in all of these. That's, that's pretty much being a wisdom keeper right there. But you're stepping into that primary role of a visionary as you go through that job interview. And so that's just one example of, of many of how you can work with this energy of the uh, soul archetypes. So what I would love for you to do is to, I'm going to uh, give you a download, and it's going to show you what it looks like to show up as a balanced, or how excess energy shows up, or how deficient energy shows up in each of these soul archetypes. And I want you to go through each of those and highlight the ones that you, um, uh oh, dog and cat fight over here. Highlight the ones that you kind of fall back into easily, or you have to really work towards not um, having these energies, or having these energies. You want to have the ones that are balanced, obviously. But, um, and then that's going to give you kind of a road map of what those percentages might be for you. If you, if you showed up with 20% in Alchemist and you look at my sheet and you say, wow, I've got like six of the things on the deficient side and six of the things on the excess side and I've only got two things on the balance side, then you know that you've got probably, um, now, all right, bear with me again. <laughs> We do this, and that is we take, um, let me make sure I can articulate this clearly. Let's, let's step into the visionary for a second. Let me articulate this very clearly and coherently for you. When you get the percentages that tell you what you are, um, and let's say you've got 19, 19, 14, 23, and 23. We give you a total that's pretty close to 100% of the entire wheel. Okay, and that's one, that's one calculation of how your energy is distributed among the soul archetypes. And then when we, di when we dissect it down even further and we take uh, one direction and we figure out the deficient, the excess, and the balance, this creates another 100%. So then your wheel is like basically 400%. Um, actually, we don't do the Wisdom Keeper because we're all trying to aspire to be that. So that's why when I'm writing 45%, even though it's, um, if you had six of one and six of another, and then 10% was uh, balanced. Okay, did I do that right? Yeah. So basically what you're doing is you're looking at this chart and you want to see where most of your energy is being expended and if most of your energy is in deficient or excess in any one of those directions 
then those are the areas that need to be balanced out in order for you to be able to be in that wisdom keeper space. Without this balance, your life is probably going to feel disjointed and compartmentalized in most of the time. So your work is separate from your home, your home is separate from your relationships, your relationship is separate from your spiritual, etc., etc. And they're not conjoined into this beautiful uh, web of, of your inner being. So that's the first step, is figuring out where is my energy being placed in all of these different directions? How am I, um, how am I being portrayed in this, in this wheel, in these soul archetypes? And then once you have an understanding of where the energy is, then you've got a map to be able to start balancing that. Now, I'm going to throw another curveball at you. Um, this is the dance that we do in the mentorship, is if you've got a, uh, if you have excess energy in the East, in a visionary, uh, that looks a lot like uh, you're fiercely independent, you're a workaholic, um, you may be living your passion, but it's like it's all-consuming. All right, so in that, um, you're also self-centered. Uh, I'm not going to write all these out. Ego-driven, uh, need to be in control. That's all excess energy in the East, okay? And if you have excess energy in the East, you are almost 100% guaranteed that you're going to have deficient ener energy in the South. And that's going to be where you are emotionally numb, uh, you have a hard time connecting with other people, you don't take time out to play, um, you usually don't trust your intuition as much because it's got to make sense to you, you uh, can talk about your experiences in life without having an emotional attachment to them, uh, you probably lack um, sex drive or intimacy in your relationships, so there's a direct correlation between the different directions. So excess energy here creates a deficiency here. A deficiency here can create an excess here, where maybe it's addictions. Or you, know, you come home and in order to unwind from working all day, you bypass this and you go right over here and you, and you binge watch Dexter. Or you have a six pack of beer or you are addicted to Facebook, whatever your addiction might be, or you overeat your emotions, um, all of this stuff. So this is the dance that we play in the medicine wheel. And it's also the dance we play in the mentorship because every direction, we're looking at the energies of that direction. Where am I right now? What's causing that from these other directions? So right now, we're getting ready to, to, to begin work in the north direction. And the students in the mentorship, they're going to take a look at their energy assessment um, packet that we give them. And they're going to see how this energy is divvied up into excess, deficient, and balanced. And then they're going to start learning how to equate that with the different directions. Like, what am I lacking or what do I have too much of in these other directions that is pulling that energy out of the balanced column? And that's how we start to, to work that energy around. So the long and short of it is, is that you've got this opportunity. You're getting some, you're getting some nuggets of wisdom to be able to uh, take this, this, this container and overlay it on your life and create for yourself a roadmap of what is your next best step. And my goal would be to inspire you to get to this spot, this wisdom keeper spot, because when you are a balanced wisdom keeper, this world will know peace like no other peace. It is the, the place that we get to. And I'll tell you an interesting um, little thing right now that I haven't sh shared this with a lot of people, but in each of the directions, there's examples of people in our world that uh, embody these different soul archetypes. 
And you can put examples for an excess visionary or a deficient visionary or a balanced visionary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, down here we're going to have some of the artists and, and people. Here we've got Steve Jobs and Barack Obama and um, Elon Musk is actually a deficient or uh, an excess East energy. When we get to the Wisdom Keeper, you've got two polarities and we have them almost being played out right now that uh, Donald Trump, the American president, is a wisdom keeper at the most um, excess wisdom keeper one can be. When you have too much energy in the wisdom keeper space, you are a master manipulator, um, you desire control over all, uh, there's, there is no truth, narcissism, is way up there and so in you have varying degrees of all of those things so that's like the most extreme and then you can still have excess energy and not be those things but you have varying degrees of them so maybe some self-centeredness or um, you know you like to be mostly in control of your current situation etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is being played out right now in the most profound way at least here in America and we're actually seeing it in other countries too. There's that authoritatum. I can never say that word. But you have many countries who are who are whose leaders are that really imbalanced excess energy of the wisdom keeper. Now the antithesis to that is somebody like um, Mother Teresa or Dalai Lama or Jesus. You know, you think about the ascended masters who really embody that that truth and see the connection the oneness of all uh, where presence um, can be felt and my hope is that in my lifetime I get to see the world led by um, people humanity who have this character in balance um, that would be beautiful. And I'm hoping that in my small way, I can help contribute to that by teaching you how to find your path back to that. All right? So uh, down below, I always have a call to action. I would love to know, one, do you have any questions uh, that I can clear up for you? And also, just um, what, what do you resonate with? in the soul archetypes. Where do you see yourself and maybe what is your, your greatest um, obstacle to getting that balance in the wheel? In the next video I'm going to uh, give you another kind of real life scenario of what it would look like um, and what we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll create a character and show in the different periods of life how things kind of got planted along this, this wheel, this course, and how that person can be in the middle of the wheel and what energies they might um, take away. When you're, when you're in the middle of the wheel, there's, there's a couple different um, perspectives. One is, what am I learning? And how do I heal? And so the first layer is understanding. And then the second layer is the doing. And that's what we'll we'll go through in the next in the next video. So if you again have any questions, please put them down below so that I can address those at the beginning of the. Um, actually, I'll probably just address them uh, as you write them. I may include them in the video. I'm not sure. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye.